What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Day Class Podcast here with Luca Lowe and Massa. One of our uh, seminar videos got a good few views in this past week, and we're going to start you guys off today by explaining a little bit about this um, Japanese jiu-jitsu style um, wrist throw, a little bit about how we make it work when it just looks like some Aikido type shit that you normally would expect from, I don't know, Steven Seagal. Tell me anything bringing that up. We're not talking about that anytime soon. <laughs> cut it, cut it, cut. <laughs> so let's start us off by uh, having a look at the video in question. That will good for y'all. That is working. So. How do you make that work? The way there's like a done with discussion. I mean, yes, but so you expect to see that type of throw. It's got like you know the free spins around and you turn and they do a whole flip and whatever. Um, what is it that you do that is an adaption from what you normally see? You said that throw is called Shihonage, right? Yeah, it's a four directional throw. You have four different chances of throwing within the same throw. Um, the changes that I Aikido Shihonage. I, I drop my I drop my uh book on my keyboard so I kinda just mute everything. Yeah, that's um a Shionage. It's a four directional throw. You have four chances of throwing within the same throw. Uh the changes I do is with your technical Shihonage. Most of the time they're sitting here and they're trying to take your wrist like right above the shoulder and trying to make you fall backwards almost for the same ukemi that you would use within a an arimi, an arimi nage, right? Mm -hmm. The changes that I do is instead of cranking the sh the wrist over the shoulder immediately, I extend outwards, almost like you were doing an udegarami, because I forgot Masa's in here and she gets mad at the Japanese. A almost <laughs> like you're doing a what the BJJ guys call a an americana, right? So if my shoulder's in real tight right here, there's not much of a crank, and it's purely the wrist, right? And a lot of people can have really loose wrists. You know, if you're used to being thrown by them, they they go a little ways. So if you're trying to throw me by this, a lot of times you can extend, get out of it. If you extend that's the what, arm slightly, um, that's what that's the way the Z lock, right? When he's talking about his aikido and stuff. No, Z lock would be more akin to this. Oh right, yeah, no, right. right. So raising the hand here, making the Z. Um, for the shield nage, if it's in tight, you're just getting the wrist. But the way I do it, as you can see in the video, I extend it slightly out to here. So when you crank the wrist, you're also assisting it with the shoulder, and you're going to tear anything you can find in the shoulder. You can cause minor damage to the elbow joint, and you can kind of make someone's wrist go limpy dippy. Yeah, that's our base white ball lock is uh, similar to our Jiko uh, Gote base lock. Um, so this is the Aikido Shihonage. Um, I know it's how cast, don't get mad. It's <laughs> the first one and it's always very good picture quality. The next technique is called Shihonage, which translates into four directional throw. Uh, this is a wonderful technique to take a look at and see how the sword work is in, in Aikido fashion directly to the movement that we need open hand. So if we were to start with the Gyaku Hanmi, Shakate Tori, one of the basic things that I need to consider is always... Damn, I'll see you, man. I love it for him using Japanese. I'm going to change my body 90 degrees. Make sure it's lit right up in front of my face. And then we whoop, get three, turn, and cut. You see how they go to the, to the shoulder blades? Mm. Off line, lift. Theirs is a lot and again, like the nicer, holding the sword, maybe. Well, it's easy to break fall from there. Yeah. Now, you, you see how much movement he has right there? Yeah. Okay. If you go to mine, you can see whenever I start applying pressure, Griff started immediately leaning with it. That's because, yeah. hey, if I want to break the wrist, I'm always going to want a secondary um, absolute for any joint that I'm attacking. So if mm -hmm. I'm trying to attack the wrist, I always want the shoulder to back it up. If I'm wanting to attack the shoulder, I'm always wanting the wrist to back it up. That yeah, way I kind of have... To... I'm, I'm doubling my chances of causing major injury. The more you twist the wrist and the more you can extend the joint where you're doing it, the less movement they have on their arm to try and escape from it, essentially. Yeah, you have more of a tear, less of a sit down. Impressive. You see, cool. Like you, you kind of see the, you see how easy it is for him to break fall, and he's not having major damage. Which there's nothing mm. wrong. There's nothing wrong with that variation. Just as a, you know, we're all about combatives here. If we're sitting here and I'm wanting to crank someone, and if we're having a situation where maybe someone clinches up, and I don't do the spinny dinny entry, I just immediately from the clinch, I strip the arm, I take control of it, and I try to do the lock. If I take it to the shoulder blades. Um, he immediately starts caving my face in. Who's going to win first? 
probably the guy cave in my face then because I'm going to want to defend myself. But yeah. if instead of taking it to the shoulder blades, if I extend it out slightly, it's going to cause his shoulders to turn, which in turn is going to take his offset arm, so his rear arm, away from me so he can't actually strike me. I'm going to tear the shoulder, I'm going to cause minor damage to the elbow, and I'm going to tear it through his wrist. So I just, I like it more as a variation because, you know, if you're doing competition grappling, most of the time they're going to tap. Whereas with the traditional Shihonage that uh, Aikido and some Aikiju Jitsu employees, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just more of a, it's not going to cause as much lasting damage. Do you have anything like that when you were doing Kempo Masa? I mean, we had like the, the Z-Lock and some basic stuff like that. Um, nothing quite that intricate though. That's fair. I think the Z-Lock was as intricate as it really got. Other than that, it was pretty just standard. This is our shit. Um, white belt takedown. It's pretty much the same sort of idea of like when you're controlling it and pushing it in that direction. We don't use it over the shoulder though. We just use it as like a sweep rather than a whole throw. See, and that's similar to the same concept. It should supply more to Chudon instead of Jodon. At a mid level. I'm sure there is a I'm sure there is a higher level one where it goes higher, but I wouldn't know what to search for it at this point, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, like, so if I can figure out how this works. Where's the Okay. What are you trying I, to I have to I have to relearn how to work this every single time. You can see on my stick figure drawing the differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yours is out here, theirs is over here, yours is like and, and you can feel it. just like doing this, I can feel the tension here as opposed to here. Well I mean like it it um it it surprises a lot of guys. I'll be training with a lot of Aiki Jiu ka or Aikido ka, and they they love Shionage. There's nothing wrong with it. If you pull it off, you feel like an you feel like a monster. Mm. Because it's it's amazing when you can actually pull it off. I just want if I get to that position, I don't want to oh I'm here. Or they slipped out and now they're they're curb stopping me. I don't want that. One thing I always have to like explain when I'm helping the white belts get that Geku Bate when I'm training with them is like if you, you can't just hold and stand with them, you need to pull them off balance and pull this arm out to get them leaning over already because then their weight's off and you have a much better time at controlling them to get them down. But also, just like if you apply this to yourself here, you've got plenty of movement room. If I pull it out here, it actually starts to hurt almost immediately. Well, it's so, like if you, um, you said there's probably something at a high level and at a low level, so you're Jodan, mm -hmm. you're Chudan. If you look into just using Aikido terminology, because that's what you can most commonly find, uh, Shihonage is going to be everything here. Everything here and outwards. That's going to be your, um, like your Kotegayashi. You can look that up and you can see kind of some semblance. Yeah. And there may be a video there where I'm talking about the, um, where I go for the Kotegayashi, I go for the inside grip, and then I do a neck bridge for the takedown, which is kind of blending a Kotegayashi, a Shihonage, and a Riminage. Oh. All of these wrist throws really are kind of looked down on because of the Aikido reputation. How much would you say you you, you make use of them as a in self defense or as a competitive grappler, as a grappling instructor? Oh, self defense! I've got a I've got a saying in my gym that I teach a lot of our guys, and it's kind of become the gospel. And uh -huh. we're kind of we're kind of known for it. And um, Clay, for example, you know we love Clay. He says that we roll mean and we're mean people, mm -hmm. but I I don't see it. Um, anytime our guys clench up to break the clinch, I always say, "Hey, just crank the wrist." Um, anytime you pen, hey, if you want to make transitioning to a different position easier, just crank the wrist or crank the neck on the way over. Um, so as a competitive grappler on the ground, I use it a lot. If we're clenched up, I use it some. If I can get to the position where I can use it to assist anything else, I use it a lot. Self-defense. You know, everyone wants to do these, you know, stagnant wrist grabs. I can do that on you all day. It's, you know, it's it's good for me to get repetition, but it's not really the most realistic. Because in reality, if someone grabs my wrist and I start trying to do this flashy dashy stuff on them, they're probably either going to pull the hand back or they're going to punch me in the face. Um, it's good training, but if someone grabs my collar, which is, I, I believe it's a little bit more common, I can trap yeah. the hand against my collar and then apply the same movements off of that. People want to say that gi and no gi is completely different, but what is this? It's cloth. If someone's just grabbing here or they go to push me and I kind of roll it over whenever I get my grip, I'm kind of entrapping it against my body. That way Actually, my man, on TikTok that way my band yesterday... can help. On TikTok yesterday, I saw someone making a comment that judo ruined themselves by uh, by pretending everyone's going to have a gi, and I was like, "Do you I, wear coats?" Like, I I love those guys. This is that is more sturdy than a damn gi, if I, if anything. Well, I love those guys, and you know the we're not getting political here. We we kind of are getting political here as far as martial arts go, but um, <laughs> BJJ. <laughs> um, you know um what all happened with that last fight I was supposed to have. 
Mm. Guy guy originally decided he wanted to fight MMA, didn't want to fight MMA, then he decided he wanted to grapple, then he didn't want to grapple, he said he has a knee injury. Um, I, if you have a knee injury and you're watching this video out there, I really hope you heal. I have one also. I was still going to grapple you. Um, no balls. <laughs> um, so... It just a lot means of these... that if my if the if the uh, ankle lock or a leg crank goes wrong, then the injury's already there. I can't do double damage. See, there you go. I mean, like mine, I, I have trouble getting out of bed some mornings because of it. But I I look at these no gi guys a lot. They say you're never gonna wear a gi. You know what I notice? Every single they, match they, they go popping out from the fucking spandex. No, no, like every match they go into, they're still wearing clothing. They still have shorts. So on. you want so you want like old school grease mud wrestling then. <laughs> Full pancreation from the Olympics. Listen, 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 listen. So, a, like, in Greece, the only thing you wore was a rope that went around your waist and tied to another appendage. Right? Now, this is a children's channel, so we can't say that. Is it? Since the is fuck it? when? When was this a children's hey, channel? Hey, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, as soon as you have that rope into it, then you have, um, you, you've got another submission option. Um, but no, like all these guys want to scream, "Hey, there's there's no gi." But as soon as you go into a it's, as soon as you go into a no gi competition, what is the biggest reasonings for stalls and just calling time within a no gi comp? A lot of you guys you guys don't do a lot of nawaza competition, but if you're going to a BJJ tournament and you're doing no gi, if you grab someone's shirt, they they usually don't like that. I, I I don't understand why. No, no, like they don't want you grabbing anything. I understand that, but they're saying, "Well, you're not going to have a gi." It kind of defeats the same or- argument. Because if you have a shirt, hey, they can still grab your shirt. It's not going to be like a competition. Hey, get in my guard and don't grab my shirt. I think everyone's just obsessed with the crackheads in fucking blazing hot Florida that always look out without their shirts on when they're trying to start a fight with someone. Listen, you, you leave my erotic dreams alone. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, any sort of final closing thoughts on, like, the idea of, I suppose, like, how we're, how you're making Aikido stuff or stuff that isn't respected actually be useful? And how what people can do to improve their wrist control and lock throws. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna speak from the heart here for a minute. If you don't respect it, I don't care. If you respect it, I don't care. I do what works for me, and I show my guys what I like. My guys they tend to do the same thing because hey, it works for them. I'm I'm gonna put it this way, uh, Luca, raise your left hand. All right, put it down. Raise your right hand. Okay, so he has he has two hands. I have two hands. So if I can do a lock, in theory, he should be able to do the same lock. So if I show you something, it's not just because, oh, he will, he's able to apply it because he's just a genius at it. No, if the if the theory behind it works, then it's going to work. The technique is sound. That's just how you one, apply the technique. I think one of the things that causes it damage is that, well, causing damage, a lot of them are worried that something's you know, going to hurt or they're not going to break the out of it properly because it's too much pain or too much grapple. It's like, that's kind of the point, my guy. If it hurts them, then you're doing it right. Well, like a lot of a lot of BJJ, you notice that they what do they say about wrist locks? Doesn't work. Okay. In a lot of BJJ tournaments, do you know what level you are allowed to start doing wrist locks at? Purple belt. Now, why why would they why would they not allow those techniques for the newer ranks? Because shit tears. Huh. So if it doesn't work, why are you withholding it from your beginners? Now you're sounding like Steven Seagal. No, <laughs> we no, have no. To like, make sure and be careful who we're teaching these dangerous secrets to. No, no, no. no. Like, well, all I'm saying at is it's like pot kettle, right? They're wanting to sit there and mm. scream that it doesn't work, but then they're having their higher level guys do it. I don't yeah. really agree with the methodology behind it's it. It's the same thing as, like, you know how, like, karate guys, a lot of the big karate guys, like, got to their first black belt in Okinawa and came back and started acting like they knew the whole fucking system. Yep. It's like you, you got the guys that are on, like, the first two or three years, and they're like, well, I haven't done this, so it's got to be non-functional, but it's like, you just haven't got to it yet. Oh, I, I cannot remember the guy's name for the life of me, right? But there was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner in Brazil who dominated tournaments using wrist locks and ankle locks. Now, at this time, no one in Brazil wanted to touch the feet because there's a lot of cultures there. Oh, that's nasty. That, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of cultures where you don't touch the feet. That's why if you look into some traditional Thai schools, you won't see them throwing a lot of head kicks to each other. They're kind of past this now, but back in the day, they wouldn't throw head kicks to each other because you're touching the, the most unclean part of your body to the cleanest part of it. We reacted to a fight that had a similar thing. <laughs> but in Brazil, this guy came up. I cannot remember his name, and I will, I will send you the guy's name. You can put it in the video just so whoever's watching can see this. 
he dominated tournaments because sitting there going through tournaments, he was doing locks that no one else was doing and applying them. 